possible. So happy Open Access Week. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the UI Library's faculty panel discussion on the theme of open access, community over commercialization. Um, I'm Sarah Scheib, Director of the Scholarly Impact Department in the UI Libraries, and I'm joined by my colleague who is not on screen right now, um, but she is Mariah Burnett. Um, she's our Scholarly Communications Librarian. Um, so I'll be moderating the discussion and Mariah will be monitoring the Q&A. So many, many thanks, many thanks to our excellent panelists for participating in this discussion. It's my honor to introduce Leonardo Marcini, is professor and chair of the Department of Preventive and Community Dentistry at the University of Iowa College of Dentistry and Dental Clinics. His current re research focus includes geriatric dental and general health epidemiology and factors influencing patient satisfaction with dental treatments. Dr. Marcini is also interested on, um, in researching about the best ways to teach dentistry with particular interest in geriatric dentistry. Welcome, Leo. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice introduction, Sarah. Appreciate yes. it. And um, our next panelist, uh, Dr. Maureen Nyman, is an evolutionary biologist and professor in the Department of Biology with a joint appointment in the Department of Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies. She has also served as a provost faculty fellow for diversity, equity, and inclusion since 2021. Dr. Nyman is a senior editor at Proceedings B, the flagship life sciences journal of the Royal Society of London. She formulated the development and implementation of their widely adopted preprint solicitation process in 2017 and continues to lead in this regard. Dr. Nyman's research program targets fundamental questions in biology centered on the evolutionary impact of genetic variation and the evolution of sexual reproduction. Dr. Nyman, Nyman, I'm so sorry, Nyman. It's okay. <laughs> I had a Dr. Nyman. Anyway, um, Dr. Nyman is also very active in community-focused science education and engagement. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Sarah, and for the nice introduction. Most welcome. Um, Deborah Elizabeth Whaley is professor of the in the Department of English and program in American Studies at the University of Iowa. Her latest and forthcoming book is the edited collection Quick Hits, Creativity in the Classroom, which will be published by the Indiana University Press in 2024. She is also the author of numerous articles, monographs, and edi edited collections on popular literature and culture and Black cultural studies. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Whaley. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Our last, um, our last panelist is teaching right now, but he'll be joining us as soon as possible. Kemper McLeod is a professor of communication studies at the University of Iowa and an independent documentary producer. A prolific author and filmmaker, he has written and produced several books and documentaries that focus on popular music, independent media, and copyright law. So our panelists will share their experiences with open access publishing and open scholarship more broadly. They will also share their views on the benefits and barriers to the free and open sharing of research outputs with the public and the academic community. We have some questions prepared, but we're reserving 20 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So please add them to the Q&A. We have lots to discuss. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're all academics, so let's start with um, some definitions. So what does open access mean to you? Why is it important? I can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. So for me, open access, you know, in some ways it, it may seem obvious, um, access <laughs> widely to scholarship, right, uh, to the masses, but there's a lot more involved, which I know we'll get into um, the weeds and the details of that. Um, and, and so there's that part, but how you make it available, right? So most generally uh, via the web or the internet, um, 
and again, we'll get into the weeds of this later, but that also brings up lots of questions in terms of access, right? Who is accessing? Who knows what is where, uh, uh, et cetera. And so, um, so generally, when I think of open access, that's what I think about. But um, I always like to add the caveat uh, as well that um, you can have something as open access, but still have some type of mechanism that makes it available, but not in a way that um, gets us into trouble. And I mean, this is Kim Bruce, um wheelhouse, like copyright infringement, and there's a whole mm -hmm. list of things that um, you know that are there to be concerned about, which we'll talk about later, um, including things that you know in my field like royalties right mm -hmm. like how, how does that work when you have stuff as open access so I'm looking forward to talking about that but that's generally how I think about it great thank you so much I think open access has evolved during the time that we have been um, hearing about the concept and the concept was early adopted Initially, the idea would be to make the uh, knowledge that has been generated within um, academic centers more widely available, uh, reducing the barriers to for readers to access it. That was, I think, the primary focus on the first moment when publications like Public Library of Science and others became available. That was about 25, 20 years ago. And then after that period of time, that has evolved into a landscape that's much more complex to navigate, where you have some uh, actors that are acting uh, in a predatory manner in the open access um, arena more often than in other areas. Um, so it becomes really tricky, especially for junior faculty to navigate, not talking, uh, also, but also talking about um, academicians in other countries where access is much more limited due to more limited resources and how those um, predatory um, <clears throat> Uh, endeavors thrive in that landscape. So um, I think open access would mean to me open access to the reader and reducing the barriers to access the knowledge, um, but not incurring into alter fees. So the model that I see as really being open access are a few handful, very serious journals that don't charge authors and don't charge subscriptions. And they are usually primarily not for profit and they are internet based. Mm -hmm. So that reduces costs and provide access. Nevertheless, someone needs to foot the bill. And that usually for those are either philanthropy or government. Mm, yes. So that's how I see that uh, in, a pers in a more you know, long-term perspective. Thank you, Leo. I Dr. agree. Neiman? Yeah, I agree with what Dr. Martini just said about a kind of ideal open access model. And I think the way that open access was first conceived of was, you know, access for everybody, no paywalls, everybody in the world can access science and arts. And I think that it has turned to some extent into a pay to play model where these both predatory journals and also some very highly prestigious journals charge pretty exorbitant fees such that the only people who can afford to publish there are the already successful. And so it's interesting to see how something that I think really was well-intentioned has turned into uh, something that actually perpetuates the status quo. So I, I again agree with Dr. Marcini and with Dr. Whaley that I think we need to think about, you know, what who is that open access for? And I think it was more for the readers than for the authors. And now I think we end up in this situation where there's inequitable access for authors to reputable open access outlets. Yes. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so let's move on. Um, could each of you uh, kind of begin by telling us about your most recent experience with open access publishing? And um, uh, I'll I can start. <laughs> you want to start, Dr. Dr. Whaley? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, two different forms. You know, we started out talking about scholarship in journals. And so that makes us think of print scholarship. Um, but I'm also thinking as someone who works in the public digital humanities, um, scholarship conceived in other ways that is open access. So uh, a lot of what I do with my research, sometimes as a companion and sometimes just as the thing, is to have open access digital um, projects. And we'll probably talk more about this later, um, but doing uh, AR, VR, virtual exhibitions that anyone who has an issue of access um, to the internet can jump into that exhibition, right? So if you can't get to a museum to experience a research focused topic, being able to access that, even if you don't have the AR, VR goggles, you can still have the experience via the internet. Um, also, I uh, do GIS maps uh, where people can go in and see how a particular subject matter um, is uh, located or connected to geography and having other types of media with that. But more uh, formally in terms of how, you know, we've been talking about and how a lot of people think about open access is as editor of uh, the journal um, about uh, Stuart Hall. Um, and, uh, you know, this started in, I started working on it, gosh, I guess in 2017, and then we finally brought it to publication in 2019. Um, and this is a journal, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's open access, so it's available online, and it was designed to be that way because the scholar that it's focused on or that it's in honor of, Stuart Hall, who was a sociologist and one of the founders of uh, cultural studies, British cultural studies and Black British cultural studies, was really committed to community college education, to um, the ideas of the importance of of early access, a lot of uh, his early publications he did with graduate students, people at different ranks, and it was available openly, right, mm -hmm. to the community. And cultural studies has this, um, I kind of think that the perception of it's this high theory thing for people in academia, but that's not how it was originally intended. And so that's my more sort of recent uh, formal experience uh, with open access. And I guess I'll just add to that and close out to say um, that we wanted the pieces not just to be open access that were published in this journal, but that were pitched at a general audience. Mm -hmm. um, yes, an educated general audience, but still with the idea that it wasn't just a high cultural theory thing online, that really we could distill those complicated ideas in a way that a wider um, public could access almost in the way of, I think um, we um, you know think of opinion pieces in newspapers, um, but there's the scholarly aspect um, be behind it. So I have lots more to say about the journal and how it came together, but I want to uh, uh, close out and I'm excited to hear from the other panelists. Thank you so much. That's so cool. Leo, would you mm -hmm. like to go next? Yeah, that. But I, I need to say that I was impressed with the, especially with the first part of your uh, talk, uh, Doctor Really, about you know how you do that in museums and op and make it more accessible to the public in general. I think this is awesome, and congratulations for that. That's awesome. That's really. I mean, this is really talking about increasing access to the a much larger audience, so that's awesome. Um, my most recent experience is much more, it's much more boring. It, you know, I was, uh, I was, I am usually publishing in the dental literature. And um, so re most recently I have the opportunity to publish in a very well-established journal published 
by a um, by a for-profit company, and I was surprised to see that there was an agreement between the University of Iowa and the company, and I was able to publish for free, right? Um, I, I did not need to pay the fees to have it on open access, but I'm sure someone paid that bill, mm-hmm. right? So it's probably into the as an addendum or as an offer to the university subscription that gave us access to that, right? So um, I still think uh, when we have this panel for the first time a few years ago, I said that and I still think that the best business model in the world is the business model of the publishing companies where they get their raw materials from the university, they get their, their labor from the university and they get the universities to buy their product. So we provide raw material, labor, as authors, as reviewers, as editors, and then we buy their product that we provide the raw material and labor to produce, right? So this, uh, that is, it's, just a phenomenal business model where you only have the management to deal with and everything else is profit, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and ever and that was roughly 10 years ago, Sarah, probably, and mm-hmm. it's still the same. They yeah. are tweaking it one way or another, making some concessions here, taking another bite there, but it's still the same um core business model. And I think we should think outside of the box with um, alternatives to this business model. Thank you so much, Leo. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, Dr. Neiman. Uh, I can echo Leo's point in being surprised to learn that journals that we formerly had to pay thousands of dollars for access for are now available for you know, free, as he clearly pointed out, it's not actually free, but we as authors don't pay because of agreements that, uh, for instance, in our case, I think the science library is fantastic. Lori Neuerberg helped build with some of these publishing houses. So that's increased access, for example, to our graduate students uh, who might not have the grant funding that they need to pay thousands of dollars in open access fees. For me, I'm engaging most often with open access through my role as the preprint editor at Proceedings B where most days I'm looking at BioArchive, which is the largest preprint server for papers in biology and helping uh, leading a big team of, of early career scientists and choosing papers that have been recently deposited in the archive for consideration for submission to our journal. And so preprints are obviously a, a subset of the open access world and have their whole host of interesting and distinct issues. But one of the founding principles of the idea of preprint repositories was indeed to make academic research immediately available to the world without barriers. Um, And of course, it hasn't been formally certified by peer review. I can tell you that in my experience, most of the papers that we see are really, really good. Mm -hmm. People are not mostly putting crap up there. They're putting stuff up there that they feel proud of. And so I'm increasingly comfortable with the notion of Maybe a preprint repository is the final home and an, an excellent good place for a, a lot of work, because, in part because it is actually open access and it's actually really, truly, freely accessible to everybody. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Ah, I love it. Um, okay, uh, so I, I'm going to touch on a theme that, that several of you have brought up already, which is that open access has come a long way over the last 15 years or so. So I want you to kind of think back. So you t- you described your recent, recent experience. I want you to think back to one of your first experiences publishing open access and compare those. Like what has changed? What's better? And what's worse? Do we want to keep the same order or um, does somebody else want to start? Dr. Good. Whaley, I think you should start. <laughs> Some of my earlier experiences is just publishing as an author. 
um, journals that were available online that were um, made to be online. So not just that they had one or two of the articles, but that were online journals, right? Uh, and so one of the problems at that moment was how will that be assessed um, for scholars in terms of promotion and tenure? Mm -hmm. And the idea that if something is widely available, that the quality is not strong. Uh, which of course is not the case. I think we've come a long way since then. But when I also think of some of these earlier pieces um, that I published online in a variety of different ways, whether it was like an online journal um, or um, you know whether it was some type of other kind of scholarly online venue that can look like a, diff a lot of different things. Um, but the quality was not necessarily that great just in terms of the interface. Um, lots of issues of access. So we talk about public access, but how does that um, come into play when we're thinking about a variety of abilities in terms of site, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, hand coordination, right? So there's a lot of ways in which we, um, I think, early on didn't think of access that are in play now. So now with these journals and other types of digital projects, there is a kind of threshold and best practices um, and just the interface and the visual aspect. I think is a lot more strong. And for scholars nowadays, oftentimes you're sort of expected to be a public intellectual um, for certain fields, right? And that happens through having a certain amount of your work available more broadly, not just to uh, students, which I think is important. And I hope we get into the sort of pedagogical aspects of that, which um, Dr. Neiman brought up. Um, but also um, in terms of, again, those scholars being able to establish uh, uh, an identity of, of how they're thinking and how they're interfacing with publics. And I think that's one of the um, big changes. And uh, also in terms of things that some scholars think about who are, you know, 10 year track faculty and even graduate students, this idea that if it's widely available, it's not good. <laughs> the mm -hmm. quality is bad or it doesn't count that is changing. We're not completely away from it not being counted, but I think we've come really far. I think for junior scholars, you know, graduate students, um, and uh, people who are, you know, if they're in academia, and I don't, I don't want to just keep this to academia because there's a lot of people who have open access scholarship in a variety of different ways and fields. Um, but, you know, one of the problems about open access is, um, you know, nowadays, especially because it, the, the access has opened up even wider electronically in terms of what we can get and how we can get it and the amount that we can get, people will steal your stuff and ideas. And I tell my my graduate students that all the time you know it's that kind of and sometimes you can say well it's really easy to trace if it's available online but then sometimes it's not right and so mm -hmm. um, I, I'm excited to hear what the other panelists think but those are some of the things I'm thinking about in terms of uh, what's what's changed thank you that's so interesting Leo interesting yeah um I I would uh, look at it in, uh, through a different perspective, in a more um, in a more um, scholarly view. Um, at in this in the sense that when I started publishing in uh, uh, public um, open access, that were just a very few selected group of journals who were open access period. There was no journals in my air, in my field that would establish journals that would ac that would accept open access articles. Not for a fee, not for anything. They would just not be open access. They were subscription only period. That was the vast majority of the then established journals. So we will have a few journals that were open access that are usually uh, uh, funded by philanthropy or government, and they would be uh, not as reputable as the 
uh, traditional model ones. Throughout the years, uh, what I have seen is that now a lot of journals saw the, an opportunity, a business opportunity there to get more revenue on top of the subscriptions. They did not reduce subscriptions. They just increased subscriptions and charged authors. So they just improved their bottom line by offering access. And of course, then there was a lot of people looking at it and saying, gosh, this there's a gold pot there. Let's get some of it too. And then you start having a multitude of players all over the world with predatory open access practices. And what I have seen was some of those players become becoming reputable wish, right? I mean, they they come a long way from being predatory and then they started being recognized and they started fighting fighting for recognition and players in that gray area can be named i will not name them but we all know who they are and they are very then they are very pervasive now yeah okay. and they they have questionable um, peer review processes and they have large, you know, important fees, but sometimes to attract really good special issues, especially, mm -hmm. especially in the niche of special issues, they would invite reputable authors and offer entirely free experience to them, yeah. right? <clears throat> to push their numbers, to improve their citation, to improve their journal of citation reports, uh, cl uh, classification and all that. Mm -hmm. So I think this is becoming really complex for junior faculty to navigate. And here is a suggestion, Sarah, that the Harden Library of Science needs to come up with a course for junior faculty on how to navigate that landscape. Oh. You know, how to recognize predatory actors, how to um, search and have a, um, a better sense of, is this journal worth pursuing? Should I respond to this invitation, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of people would uh, say, if you get something in the mail and you know, don't know where it comes from, just say no to it. That's good practice overall. But is Thank that you. true for every single email? Uh, sometimes it becomes really nuanced, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's not that obvious for uh, for part of the audience. So I think... It would be really, it, that comes now a time where we need to educate, mm -hmm. right, about scholarly publications. Thank you, Leo. And I will just add that um, the Hardin Library and um, my own department, Scholarly Impact, we do offer workshops that are open to everyone on uh, publishing open access and predatory publishers. So um, uh, I will uh, I'll, uh, forward those links on to you. Uh, Dr. Neiman. One of the most interesting consequences of open access that we've seen emerge is that papers that are published open access are cited more and have higher altmetric scores. And so that was not necessarily a, a prediction of, of the phenomenon, but it has happened. And so that this particular pattern leads to concerns that I have regarding uh, scholarly impact, how are you evaluating it when some people have, let's say, more funds to publish open access than others? And, and there even are, there's these hybrid journals that many of us have seen our society journals adopt. You know, they're sort of traditional print publications that have added um, open access op options, typically for pay. And those papers, even within those journals, are more highly cited. And so I think an important question that I have that I've seen emerge as a kind of an epiphenomenon of the whole 
open access thing is this challenge regarding how we evaluate scholarly impact when it's actually influenced by not just like which journal you're publishing in, but whether it's open access. And of course, there's all these other upstream issues that cascade down into where your work ends up and who can access it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. That 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 segues right right directly into my next question, which is how has open access benefited you both individually and your research community? Dr. Whaley? Yeah. So it it's benefited me in a, a number of ways. And I'll talk about a pedagogue, a teacher first, and then a scholar second, maybe a little bit uh, as an editor and then working on a journal. So there's lots of different hats I've I've worn for this uh, issue. But uh, you know, when I'm teaching courses, I'm always thinking about the cost that students endure. Right. Uh, and the degree to which I can have a certain number of materials widely available to them without them having to buy the entire book. Um, things like that are really important to me. So that might change the content of a course. Do I have them read uh, pieces that have appeared in online venues or in journals where there's open access or materials that the library has access to? Or now there's monographs that presses like, um, I'm thinking of like University of Michigan Press uh, has published like open access monographs. Monographs. And so just thinking about striking that balance in my courses, I have found has been really helpful for students. And whatever's helpful for students is always helpful for me, right? Because I want them to have a positive experience. That's what we're here for. That's what it's about. I'm also a scholar. And so I spoke to this a bit earlier. Um, I, you know, I do think of myself as a, a, a public intellectual. I write for a lot of different venues. I write for newspapers, um, online journals, you know, as well as the the typical types of sites uh, where you are, um, where it's not open access. But the point is I'm having some of my material widely available or that I've made widely available through my website and other types of portals has, I mean, just to be like, Frank, I don't know if this is crude, but has really helped my career in, in ways in which if I didn't have a sort of sense of open access, public intellectual, making my work available in a variety of ways for students and the public, I, you know, my, I think my career would look uh, a lot different. So um, it's benefited me in that way um, as well. Uh, as someone who's the editor of an, an online journal, it's been great to build community. Uh, I said this before, to be able to distill complex ideas uh, in a way that people can conceive of that and practice in everyday life and written in a way that's smart, intellectually grounded, but quote unquote accessible. But also when I was a graduate student, I worked, I was managing editor of the journal American Studies when I was a grad student. And I've seen the financial side of that. So how did we live? How did we get our RA ships? How, how was I even able to have that experience that led me to be able to do things like edit addressing the crisis for University of Iowa? I had a funded RA ship for the journal. Where do we get the money from that? We get some money from you know the university, but also the journal survived on subscriptions from libraries, subscriptions from scholars and people reading the journal. And it's expensive <laughs> to create a journal. So I've seen like the budget side of that as someone who was managing editor for American Studies and the printing, how much does printing cost? So, I mean, in some ways it freed some stuff up for journals who were print and then went online in terms of production, it can cut down on cost. But there's a whole other kind of like web of, um, finances, uh, I think, uh, to think about um, in, in this venture. And so I guess I will say, if there was a benefit, um, I can see how maybe not just relying on uh, library subscriptions and individual subscriptions uh, can be helpful and having open access can cut down on some sides of the production costs, but it's, it's very uh, complicated. So 
Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, uh, Dr. McLeod, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you after your class, running straight from class into, into this, uh, this session. Um, so we're currently discussing um, how open access has benefited us individually and as a research community. And we kind of have an order going, so I'm going to um, uh, send it to Leo next. Well, sounds good. I think... Um... I, for, I fortunately had uh, access to the information that citations would be higher with open access early on. So I have been um, favoring open access publications whenever possible, whenever either my budget would allow or whenever there would be an opportunity to publish open access. Then I can see that trend on my own publications that um, there is a clear correlation between being open access and the number of citations. So that has really helped. One thing that we need to consider in that equation is that citations from developing countries, they tend to be even higher when you mm -hmm. have open access because in these countries, the universities don't have the money to pay for the subscription except for a very um, uh, few elite, elite um, uh, institutions. So they... Uh, so then you get more citations in the, especially in the global south, right? So I am originally from Brazil, and it's it's pretty clear that you know um, they would cite papers of mine if they are in open access much more often, uh, mm -hmm. and sometimes we have um, you know uh, a sequence of papers dealing with a specific issue and they are, you know, in, in, where we are putting increments of knowledge into that issue and improving the, the, the understanding of that question. And, uh, and, there, and when they cite, you can clearly see that there is a black because one of the papers were not published open access. So they, then they cite the paper prior to that and the paper after that, but don't cite the one that was not open access. So it's very clear an issue of accessibility. So I think it's, we also need to consider that when we think about how it impacts not only our careers, but the impact of what we do, right? Uh, which is a very important outcome, I think, for all of us. Thank you so much, Leo. Dr. Neiman? I don't have that much to add. I think that as a scientist like Dr. Marcini, I've had similar uh, outcomes with papers that I'm publishing, open access being more widely cited and by more people from around the world. Um, it's been especially important to me to try to publish the scholarly work that I do that's actually related to equity. I do some science studies work in a forum where it actually can be accessed by the people who we're trying to reach and trying to hopefully amplify and elevate. So, and it certainly has helped science become more accessible um, around the world and, and to be available more quickly. Peer review can take a very long time. So if there's a way to get it out there, like in an open access preprint server, then we can also achieve some of those goals as well. Excellent point. Thank you. Dr. McLeod. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Yes, I, um, I'm sort of putting my uh, panelist hat on after teaching. So <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so the, the question is about how open access has impacted my career and like some examples that I could provide. I thought I'd start with um, back in 2005, uh, Creative Commons uh, debuted right around that time, around 2004, 2005, which is a kind of open access licensing model that can be applied to music and books and so on. And um, my book, uh, titled Freedom of Expression. Um, uh, it came out through um, a trade press, Doubleday, um, which is owned by Random House in 2005. And I was kind of shocked to learn that my editor at the house had my back in terms of um, letting me uh, have, uh, letting me place a PDF version of this book um, as a uh, 
a Creative Commons licensed PDF. So people could still purchase the no. physical copy, um, but they had access through my website and through other websites because it started proliferating. Um, uh, people had access to the PDF. In fact, I found out later that the one of the reasons uh, or one of the things that helped this book win an American Library Association the, their Obler Award for Best uh, Scholarly Work in the Area of uh, Freedom of Expression was because it was available as a downloadable PDF to the people who were doing the awards. So they had instant access to my book when, you know, the deadline was coming up and they weren't necessarily able to get the physical copies of the book into the panelists' hands. So that, you know, that's like a direct correlation that I, I likely, um, I was told informally that it, it helped me get into the queue, uh, basically, of being considered. Um, also, the reason why it's uh, named uh, Freedom of Expression is because as a kind of performance art uh, type stunt. Back when I was in, in a grad student, I applied with the United States Patent and Trademark Office to trademark the phrase freedom of expression. Oh, wow. Um, just, to, just as a test to see if the you know, United States government was willing to let someone have private ownership um, and exclusive access to a phrase like freedom of expression. And actually, they did have a problem with it. But the problem was with my application, I didn't spell out freedom of expression in all capital letters um, in the application. So once I modified the application to say freedom of expression, screaming in capital letters is, is the required by the form, uh, then that was no problem. The application sailed through and I, I had, um, yeah, uh, I own freedom of expression within the context of uh, uh, print publications, basically. Basically. So if the ACLU wanted to uh, publish a magazine called Freedom of Expression, I could have theoretically um, sued them. So that, that's just an aside. Wow. But then later on, um, I guess about five years later, Duke University. So that's a trade press, which let me do that. Um, and they saw the value in doing that. They realized that it's not going to eat into physical sales. And in fact, it would. Uh, uh, they accepted the logic, which I think is true, that it was basically a promotional, uh, it, like a, a way of promoting the book because a PDF doesn't replace the the physical book itself. And then uh, on the academic press side, uh, Duke University did two books on a copyright that I uh, co-wrote and co-edited, Cutting Across Media and uh, Creative License. And both of these are licensed under a uh, Creative Commons license. Um, and in those cases, yeah, but in turn, people have been talking about citations and citations of these books are I, high, I think, in part because they're accessible. Um, and, and, you know, my book for... Uh, Double Day was never going to be a bestseller. It, it was really a book written by an academic who tries to, uh, as as Deborah uh, mentions, um, you know, tries to also be public facing and find ways to speak to as general audiences, as a wide audiences as possible. But you know, that book wasn't a bestseller, and I. I I, I, there's no empirical way of me knowing whether or not it hurt my uh, physical copy sales or not, but I can't imagine that it did. Uh, and so those are like three examples of ways in which um, I've actually been able to get whole books out there because that's a little more unusual than, uh, you know, within open access worlds, uh, you know, journal publishing is the, the most typical route. And so it did take a little bit of extra effort, but it turned out really all I had to do was ask. And my editor at Duke University Press, Ken Wessiger, also, I believe, um, uh, immediately just said yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up and I hope that's answered the question. And, um, uh, that's productive. wonderful. Thank you. You've actually kind of condensed several of our early questions into one response. So, th so thank you so much. So um, I, I said that I would leave the last, the last, 20 minutes for um, audience, questions from the audience. We haven't received any yet, although there's some um, very useful links in the in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to keep going with our prepared questions because we haven't gotten through them all yet. Um, so uh, talk, we've talked about benefits. Let's uh, shift gears to barriers. 
So what barriers have you found, um, have you encountered to publishing open access and what advice do you have to your colleagues about overcoming those barriers? Uh, so Dr. Whaley, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you again. Sure. I think some barriers we've talked about already in terms of different types of access with a range of abilities. Um, socioeconomic class can come into play with that as well in terms of how we think about um, open access, the exploitation of authors, the sort of monetary cash flow of journals. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of you know, writers, I mean, if you're a novelist and you have an agent, you know, you're selling a book or you're just squarely writing for the public sphere, you might get uh, a lot of royalties and such. Um, a lot of academics do not. I've been, I've been lucky because I try to have books that kind of meet that middle ground of um, being directed towards a mass audience um, as well as something that can be used in the classroom. So I'm better on the royalty side. But if that's something that, you know, you're sort of thinking about if your work is openly, you know, out there in a way in which royalties do not come into play, uh, that could be an issue. We've already talked about things like um, tenure and promotion, um, which can be a, an obstacle. And so in terms of advice, I, I really liked some of the things that um, Dr. Um, Marchini said about, you know, advice for, for scholars, et cetera. I thought that was really on point and smart. One of the things that I do, uh, you know, in terms of uh, this discussion is just have people think really um, concretely about having a plan of what part of their work they want to be public facing and be really mm -hmm. deliberate about mm -hmm. that and where and what that's going to look like. I counsel scholars to not let their work get out there publicly too soon, not just because of what I was talking about earlier in, in terms of like the flow of ideas. And, and how that can work, but then just also that you 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 want to have some sense of establishing yourself in a variety of ways before you put things out there too soon. So thinking about that, um, that is um, uh, advice that I offer. But I'll close to say the other thing is that, you know, I, I really liked um, Dr. McLeod's um, points as well in terms of kind of like hybrid um uh, types of models, right? Where you may have a portion of your work or earlier iteration that you can publicly access, but then think about, you know, or, or I guess maybe, yeah, or, you know, think about the ways in which you can have some work that is available in a variety of different ways. And that helps kind of like broaden out your portfolio. Um, can you have a version of your work that's public facing and open access that's a companion to mm -hmm the the monograph or the article or whatever instead of as competition. So those are some of the types of things that I, I like to advise and some of the things I'm thinking about in terms of problems with uh, open access that can come into play. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Uh, Leo. Well, I, I would like to, again, um, you know, ask people to be attentive to the venue they are publishing, uh, to be attentive to predatory journals and predatory practices. As we have discussed before, some of those are becoming really nuanced. And, um, and I think people need to sharpen their judgment uh, skills to assess appropriately the journal, you know, and not fall prey to some of the um, bad actors that are out there. So it, um, I think, especially for junior faculty, when in doubt, ask, right? Mm -hmm. come, come talk to more senior faculty, people who had had a little bit more experiencing, experience on publishing. I am, I, my experience is more with uh journals um uh but i know there are also bad actors in other areas like the internet like uh public repositories of um different sources where you know 
it's not only that you may fall into a financial trap, but you may also fall into uh, um, trusting your work to a unreliable um, platform that would not make your work available uh, all the time that would, you know, um, go off and and your work is then um, just disappear from the from the platform or that promise not to charge but there are a lot of ifs and um and end up that it it, it charges something for some uh people um and not for others so i think it's really important um to look at who are you dealing with? And uh, in, in when you have a question, don't you know? Don't be shy to ask a uh, more senior faculty member or go to the library. I mean, the librarians are there. They're a great resource. Uh, they can provide you with wonderful information about um, the publishers. And you know, sometimes you may not get a yes or no answer. It's a little. The reality is many times more nuanced than that, and but you are going to get more information to make a more informed decision. Excellent advice, and thank you for for plugging librarians. We love we love to get questions like this. Um, it's it's uh, uh, yes, we love to receive those questions. Um, uh, Dr. Neiman. Uh, I have just a simple answer, which is access often is really a function of how much the open access costs. And very often, unless you have a grant that can pay those bills, and especially if you have had the foresight to write open access fees into a grant, you're going to be shut out. Um, to some extent, that's changing as these subscriptions that we've discussed are becoming more widely available. So now, like the University of Iowa does have subscriptions that enable free or so you know free to us open access publishing in some in some good journals, but it's still a challenge. So a concrete piece of advice is to write open access publication fees into grant proposals. And you'll be happy that you have that, you know, let's say a few thousand dollars down the road when you have the opportunity to publish your paper somewhere that where you do have to pay to play. Excellent, excellent practical advice. And yes, we are we are um, entering into more and more of these open access agreements. But, you know, there are a lot of publishers where that's going to be a tough nut to crack. And I'm thinking about things like Elsevier and Springer Nature and, you know, some of these really biggies. And so, um, yes, you know, open access, uh, writing your open access fees into your into your grants is always, always a good idea. Uh, Dr. McLeod. Hi. Yes, uh, I actually, I don't have anything else to add to what my uh, co-panelists have said. I, the things that I would have focused on mostly were covered by Dr. Whaley, I think, because we have similar experiences. Um, I will say, actually, as an aside, though, <clears throat> uh, that I've found myself, or I've intentionally not been publishing in journals over the past few years, um, because I don't want to sign over my copyrights to the journals and I've uh, I don't necessarily have access to grants that can enable me to pay the open access fee of, uh, uh, you know, a, a journal. Um, and I, I think <clears throat> I guess the bigger picture is I I tend to work like just the way my brain works. I I don't really I, I like to work on big projects on books and I like to have ideas marinate for a long time. So uh yeah, it, basically, my my focus has been turned towards books. But fortunately, I have been able to, at least in now four of my books, actually, um, uh, be able to have a Creative Commons or open access uh, license attached to that book so that it's uh, uh, um, uh, so, yeah, uh, so that it's more accessible. And so with that example, my advice is simply, it never hurts to ask. I was surprised when, you know, basically Random House agreed to do it this uh, and not as surprised that Duke University Press. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, I guess the the main advice that I have is it never hurts to ask because you might be surprised. Uh, the flip side is I also know the realities and so what the answer is, at least within journal publishing is. And that's honestly one of the reasons why I stopped publishing in journals largely. 
Yeah, excellent, excellent points. Um, more and more university presses are starting to engage with open monographs, um, University of Michigan Press, MIT Press, um, uh, lots of lots of um, uh, university presses moving in this space. And, and yeah, you know, journal publishing is definitely a challenge for folks who don't have research funds. Um, but well, I, I want to tie that into the next question, which is other forms of open scholarship. And so, you know, what has been, you know, Dr. Neiman, you, you spoke specifically to your experience with preprints, which can be a great way of publishing open access without paying open access fees. Um, so, so what has been your experience with preprints, things like open data, open science, public digital humanities? Um, uh, let's, let's add that into the mix here. Uh, uh, Dr. Whaley? Sure. Well, I, I talked a bit about the public digital humanities type of work, you know, whether that's GS mapping, whether it's virtual exhibitions, uh, whether it's reconceiving of a written project as digital or having something that's a born digital intellectual thing that you can make widely available to the public, I think is um, really uh, essential. One of the things that I uh, oftentimes ask people who come to me for advice about writing, whether it's an undergraduate or a graduate student or, you know, um, someone who's an established scholar with a tenure track position, what do you want this project to do? And I think that is a really important question in terms of open access. Who is your audience? What do you want this to do? Other, since I've already talked about um, the public digital humanity, something else that I was thinking about is some of the work that, uh, you know, my colleagues in African American studies here at Iowa do, you know, so they're working with communities. So that question of what do I want my work to do sometimes involves communities. And so that may mean thinking about how you can have your work available to the communities in which you're engaging with and writing about. I think of folks like one of my colleagues in African American studies and sociology, Victor Ray, who just, um, you know, a couple of years ago wrote this book on critical race theory, which is a really big issue in the public sphere, um, no matter what side you weigh in on it, one of the things I was thinking about in terms of reconceptualizing public access is for what was available for like a few dollars um, on Amazon. And so that's not free. But I was just sort of thinking about it. And I haven't even asked them, like, did that like increase like a lot of sales to do that, to have it available for like a couple dollars, um, but also make it, make a scholarly work accessible for something that's really important going on in society right now that is affecting public policy and pedagogy and teaching in a number of ways. And so we only have a couple minutes, so I'm going to leave it there. Thanks. Thank you so much. I love your uh, bringing the audience and what is the purpose of the work into, into the discussion. Thank you so much. Yes, we only have a couple of minutes left. So Leo, on to you. I will pass on that because I don't have much experience on it. And I think we'll benefit more from the other panelists. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Neiman? Uh, I probably have too much experience with these things. I don't want to take all the time. I can say that I think preprints are a tremendously positive development in facilitating the quick uh, availability of high quality work to the world. And I think that the the notion that just because it isn't formally peer reviewed doesn't mean that it's worthy of citation is really fallacious, especially in light of a lot of the biases and challenges associated with formal peer review, like these sort of networks of colleagues who review each other's papers in a sort in an uncritical fashion. For example, um, Open data, fantastic and really important in science. And uh, so I, all of these things, I think, are positive developments with challenges that are that are nuanced and complicated. But I think that we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. McLeod, do you have anything to add? Well, we're out of time, but I, I'll just <laughs> echo uh, I, the most realistic path forward considering the economic limitations of op the open access model for a lot of people, the most, uh, yeah, uh, the thing that makes the most sense to me is the preprint model. And because I have, I found that journal publishers give the most amount of flexibility with that. Whereas like one of the things that's basically ended, stopped me from um, publishing in journals is just, battling for you know the right to have something creative commons or open access licensed um and 
uh, I often lost those battles. <laughs> and but the the but the preprint option is like uh, one that a lot of publishers, journal publishers, have warmed to, and I think that's the best path forward. Yes, yes, I agree. It's um uh, lots of promise in that model. Lots of progress has been made, and but the challenges still remain. Um, thank you so much to our excellent panelists for this. It's just been such a wonderful discussion. Um, thank you so much, everyone who has joined us today. I apologize for going a little over time, but hopefully um, you enjoyed the discussion. Um, we'll be re we'll be sharing the recording out. Um, on our website and um, also to the folks who registered. So thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful open access week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.